Thank you, Mr. Annan, for your inspiring words. You spoke about hope, hope that we can turn ambitions into action, and I agree with you entirely. Today's event showcases 17 concrete examples to show that the leap from ambition to action is possible. And the world needs these ideas. The world needs your ideas. And I don't have to tell you why this is so important. Because we have to limit global warming, but at the same time, we have to adapt to the consequences of the global warming that already are happening. And we are seeing the impact of climate change around the world. Uh, at this moment, my colleagues are in a meeting to talk about uh, the uh, consequences of Hurricane um, uh, Irma at the moment at our islands. Uh, we know that uh, St. Martin has been hit very, very badly. And uh, I've been in contact with them this morning with our Prime Minister. And today we will discuss further. But this is only one of the examples because we see the impact of climate change around the world. We see the rivers burst their banks in China, where the Yellow River is flooding and has costed hundreds of lives. We, see, we saw in Japan, early July, hundreds of thousands of people had to be evacuated. In Nepal, in Bangladesh, in India, the monsoons claimed over 1,500 lives last week. And even in countries that don't suffer normally from flooding, like Peru and Canada, there were floods this year. And last week, as you noticed, the US joined the list again. And the threat comes from the sea too, not only from the rivers. As you know, Bangladesh, for example, is not only suffering from the monsoons, but it also risks losing one-fifth of its territory to the sea. With 160 million people, this is really, really a disaster if that's going to happen. And the other side of the coin is drawn. The Middle East is drier than ever. Italy experienced its driest spring and summer in 60 years, and there wasn't even enough drinking water for the people of Rome. And the impact of this all doesn't affect, just affect the people in those regions, or the li livability in the regions, or the economic situation in their country. We're also seeing something else. Already, more people are displaced by natural disasters than by conflicts. Already, there are more climate refugees than war refugees. And we don't always see them here in the West, because climate refugees tend to flee within their own country or to a neighboring country. They flock to cities because they can no longer live on the land and with heavy hearts, they abandon their own region where their family has lived for generations. And in the places where they go, more and more people are crowded together, bringing more and more tension between populations. And this makes climate change a driver of conflict. And Mr. Middeldorp, who will also speak to us this afternoon, our chief of defense, has noted in various forums that the civil war in Syria was preceded by a seven years drought in the country's main farming region. Harvest failed in the red colored area on the map, causing many farmers and their families to move to the cities. And that's where the conflict started. And the same is true of Arab Spring. It started when the people of Cairo and Tunis took to the streets to protest at a high price of bread. Wheat crops had failed as a result of forest fires, floods, and that in turn were caused by climate change. And my point is this. Water and the big challenges associated with it are not just an issue for water ministers or climate ministers. Of course, they want to help countries with problems, but water is also crucial for international stability, which also makes it a matter for ministers of defense, and ministers of foreign affairs, even the prime ministers and the presidents of the different countries. They shouldn't only talk about how to stop migration by creating a defense ring around Europe. They should also be concerned with projects that make the regions more climate resilient. And the United Nations 
estimates the number of climate refugees will reach 200 million by 2050. And these are the world's most vulnerable people, those who live off the land. And over half of the world's population, really over half of the world's population, lives on coasts exposed to the risk of flooding as the sea level rises. It's not just about countries like Bangladesh or India. In 2015, the American news organization Climate Central predicted that 414 cities in the US will suffer the same fate as the island state of Tuvalu. They will just be taken over by the sea. And they are not the smallest cities. The list includes Miami, as seen on the screen, New Orleans and New York. So if we do nothing, large parts of these cities will be uninhabitable in less than a century. Ladies and gentlemen, in recent years, I have traveled far and wide to spread the message about water and to share Dutch experience with other countries. And I've seen a great deal and I've learned a great deal. And when you take a boat trip in Vietnam, you feel the threat. When you stand beside the rivers of Bangladesh, you feel the threat. And when you stand on the seawall of Jakarta, as yet only about a meter high, you feel the threat. And it doesn't make me despair. On the contrary, it puts me in a fighting mode. If I refuse to accept these developments as a fact of life. My travels and the many talks I've had with business rep representatives traveling with me have also filled me with hope, as you will fill me with hope today also, because those businesses and you can find solutions. We can do this. We can anticipate the, the impact of climate change and we can act. And we are doing more research. We, are, we have more knowledge than ever before. And for example, Deltares, the Dutch Institute for Applied Research in the field of water, uses models to indicate precisely where drought and floods will strike. So we can act. Like the model on the screen, you see the orange parts of the world uh, is the, are the parts where the water shortages will increase. The green parts are the parts where water shortages will be less of a problem. And this knowledge is very, very important, but it enables us to take targeted measures. And we are not powerless, we can do something. And my own country, I think, is an excellent example, because 2,000 years ago, the Netherlands was a land of marshes and swamps. And the Romans didn't even think it was worth conquering. They advanced, <laughs> stopped at the Rhine, and the muddy swamp at the north didn't interest them at all. So starting in the late Middle Ages, we've made our country to what it is today, step by step. We reclaimed water, land from the water, most recently the big port extension near Rotterdam. And now, in 2017, I can say that we are the safest delta and one of the most prosperous nations in the world. So, so much for the muddy swamp. But for me, it's clear. We can do something, we do have future pers perspectives, and there are author alternatives as you are showing us today. So hopeful developments can be found in numerous places. Last October, I was in Iran. I heard about the Lake Urmia. It's a salt lake as big as the Netherlands, which is drying up fast. And these satellite images date from 1984 to 2014 and the water level is sinking by almost a meter a year. Only 5% of the water is left. And it's a salt lake, and the water that has left has got saltier and saltier, killing the fish, and the more the water level sinks, the more salt is blown over the surrounding farmland. But since 2014, the Iranian government has taken steps to tackle this problem, and a dam is being built along with tunnels and canals to transport water from the Levin River to the lake. And they're still not ready, they're working on it, but they try to find solution to restore uh, the original situation. And of course, it's more difficult for hurricanes. Uh, they can be very destructive, and humans can be very destructive. 
but we are able to repair the damage. And the same is true for the Lost Plateau in China. I think uh, a lot of people know these pictures. Um, these are two pictures of the same valley uh, taken by the American journalist John Liu. And the first dates from 1995. And the second, the green one, shows the plateau as it is now, as it is today. And for centuries, local uh, farmers grazed their herds of sheep, cows and goats on this lost plateau. And it became barer and barer, and there was no vegetation left. And the rain was no longer absorbed uh, by the soil. It flew, flew directly into the Yellow River, and the plateau became a desert. And until China resolved to replant the, fen the valley and offered farmers financial compensation for a 10-year period, if they kept their animals inside. Um, and in the space of 15 years, the plateau was transformed from an arid desert to a green valley. So it's possible. It's possible to return to the original uh, situation. And these examples, I think, are inspiring. These give hope. They show that uh, humankind is very resourceful, which brings me back to the present day. Because today's pitches, will testify to that resourcefulness. If we do our best, we can create water in the desert. If we do our best, we can extract energy from the heat locked in the oceans. If we do our best, we are able to prevent plastic to come into our waters. And making waves is all about making things possible. And I hope that everyone will go home with a list of concrete actions to take and the world can benefit from your inventiveness. And it's your responsibility, the responsibility of everyone here, to take these innovations further. And there's a great deal at stake, and we can help to make the world safer for millions of people. We can help to make the world more stable, so that people have more reason to stay in their own region, and instead of having to flee. And water, is the responsibility of the world's political leaders. And we are making waves today, not only in the cause of climate and water. We are making waves today to awaken the political leaders of the world and show them that we need their joint action. And you're part of that. I wish you a good day today.